Hi, and welcome to the Megalia Rose Studio, the Watercolor Batik Workshop. This video will take you step by step through the process I followed in creating the Watercolor Batik Painting Barn Dance. If you have seen my other demonstrations of Watercolor Batik, you will want to be prepared for me to take a different approach. I usually plan every line, color, and step in advance, but this time I let the painting lead me. This led to a few frustrating developments, but these challenges helped develop both my problem-solving skills and confidence in my choices. My two basic goals in creating this painting were to fill the page with movement and to try some new bright color, uh, which with my more traditional colors would be, it'll give me some interesting combinations. I have rarely used Thalo Blue, so this one is the new color I'm going to be working with. It's easy to become comfortable with the same colors on our palette, but sometimes a little change can take us in new creative directions. Now, this isn't a recommendation to buy the first bright, shiny new tube of color that you see in an advertisement, but be aware of subjects that might induce you to try something a little outside your usual comfort zone, or observe the color choices of other artists that you admire, and try something new once in a while. This photograph and the next few photographs illustrate how I use a cut and paste method to refine my initial drawing. My assessment of the first draft of my drawing was that the legs of both roosters needed to be lengthened. This would enhance the dynamic look of movement that I was looking for. This method helps me to visualize how the changes will affect the entire composition. Here you see how I've used a piece of bond paper and traced part of the original leg, but then redrew it, erased the old leg, and now have put the new, what I would call the cut and paste part of this, the new leg over the old legs area and see how it is now interacting with the tail feathers of that bottom right hand bird. Here you can see both birds where I've continued to trace, uh, redraw, cut out, and paste a new leg onto each of the birds. Here is a close-up of the previous photograph. Here, having used those little cut-out legs on my roosters, I have gone ahead, erased the old legs on both roosters, and through the back traced on the new legs, which I think are a great improvement to the overall composition. Here I have begun to darken the final pencil drawing, with a Sharpie Ultrafine black pen. In this photo, you can see how I have darkened the entire painting, but I have not included a background. I'm going to be actually painting the roosters first and then seeing how the, the colors strike me and then I will be drawing in a background later on in the process. I have laid the Jin Washi over my inked drawing. Jin Washi is a Japanese paper. It's very thin, almost transparent, and it has lots of little fibers, silvery fibers running through it. And here you can see how transparent it is since you can see the inked drawing below. Using the same Sharpie Ultra Fine Black Pen, I trace the image onto the Jin Washi paper. I am also using a Micron .005 for more fine detail areas. Uh, remember, Jin Washi has a smooth and a rougher side, and it is up to you which side you decide to use. In this particular painting, I am using the rougher side because I enjoy the way the paint moves a little more into other areas, giving sort of a free look to it. Here you can see that I used finer lines for the face areas of the both roosters. And what's nice for detail areas is the black Pigma Micron .005 pen, so that you don't have too wide a line when you're both coloring and adding the wax and have to have a, a more careful area defined. Exciting! Time to actually start putting on some watercolor washes. Here I have used watercolor 
of Payne's Gray and Raw Sienna for the legs of both roosters. And the wattles of both roosters are pyrrole red. This is a very up close shot of the claws on the upper left hand rooster uh, showing you the shading of the raw sienna and the Payne's Gray and the claws painted with uh, Payne's Gray. I have applied melted wax to the dry areas that I have painted and that would be the claws, legs, and the wattles and crowns of the roosters. And now I've added new gamboge on the beaks. The upper left rooster's neck ruff and rump are painted with quinacridone gold and highlighted with quinacridone burnt orange. The lower right rooster's neck ruff and rump are to be white, but I have shaded them with a very dilute raw sienna. Here is a detailed shot of the upper left hand rooster. You can see how his neck ruff and the rump feathers, you can see more in detail how I've shaded those. White is always difficult to portray uh, in certain circumstances, but the ruffas on the lower right hand rooster are to be white, but I have shaded those with a uh, dilute raw sienna just to give some difference. Otherwise, if it's just the straight white, it's a little glaring and you cannot really see shading. I have now covered all of those recently painted areas with melted wax. Be sure that you uh, let the paint dry before you apply the wax. I've also applied wax, which you can't see, the areas that will be highlights, so they'll be pretty much pure white. You can't see that, but I do know where I want them and I have covered them with melted wax. I have begun to paint the wing of the upper left rooster. Um, I'm using quinacridone and burnt orange and I mix that with a little cobalt blue for darker areas. The wing of the lower right rooster is painted with burnt umber, raw umber, dilute indigo and just a touch of pyro red for fun. More work will be done on both wings uh, to shade. After those areas that I uh, just discussed have dried and been waxed, I begin a period of marathon painting. This often happens when working with watercolor batik. When critical areas are safely under wax, you can proceed to a lot of other areas at the same time. The body areas of both roosters are painted with concentrated quinacridone gold with a little thalo turquoise dropped in. This is a color I don't use too often. I've had it in my little paint box and I thought this might be a fun opportunity to use it. You can see a little bit of color bleeding into the back wing of the upper left rooster. This was a judgment call on my part. I wanted a little bit of diffusion here. I've given both roosters an about black tail feather to help me see how I want to pursue with those tails as far as value and other colors. As I told you before, this painting is sort of leading me I haven't made a lot of plans in advance. Here you can see I have gone over and once the area was dry added some additional color, most of that is burnt umber, to the wing on the rooster to the lower right. Following the same procedure on the back wing, although lightening the color a little bit to give a sense of um, being further away, I have used the same colors on that upper wing on that left rooster and again dropped in some thalo turquoise here and there to look as a shadow effect. Continuing to have some fun with that thalo turquoise, I've applied uh, some of that to several of the tail feathers on each of the birds. As you can see, the colors are starting to come together a little bit the thalo um, in the bodies and then the tail feathers and connecting both birds also. In this close-up photo is something I wanted to uh, quickly talk to you about. Um, you'll notice how the watercolor runs along the fibers and also the basic fabric of the gin washi. And it's important at this point not to panic. This is just one of those very magical and unpredictable traits of gin washi. I know in advance that it will show through on some of the other tail feathers, but that's come with the fun and you just have to kind of relax and go with it and have a let's see what happens attitude. Here is a close-up detail photo of the 
progress on the tail feathers of that upper left hand rooster. Wax has been applied to all the dried painted tail feathers and I continue to paint the remaining tail feathers with quinacridone gold and when dry cover them with wax. And you will notice in those overpaint areas where the thalo has run in, the quinacridone gold sort of mixes with it and makes a green. This is just part of the batik process and you have to relax and enjoy it. Here is a close-up detailed photo of the upper left rooster's tail. You'll see um, that there are two left unpainted and we'll deal with those soon. Again, another close-up so that you could better see those tail feathers and blending of colors on the lower right-hand rooster. After melted wax has been applied to all those quinacridone gold tail feathers, the remaining the tail feathers are painted with Payne's Gray and when that is dried they're covered with melted wax. So at this point the roosters are complete. My question to myself now is how shall I complete the background? I return to the inked drawing that I made on the uh, drawing paper of the roosters and then inked over with the ultrafine sharpie and after looking and meditating for a while, I decided to have the roosters in front of a defined background. I decided there will be wooden planks hitting at a barn doorway, framing the roosters, ambiguous greenery in the bottom, and a highlighted blue sky above. Here is my preliminary sketch in pencil drawn on that inked version. When I'm satisfied with the background drawing, I carefully lift the sheet of Jinwashi with the completed waxed roosters and lay it over my pencil drawing of the background. I don't want the background overemphasized, so I go ahead and I trace the background that I've drawn onto the drawing paper and I trace it onto the Jinwashi with the smaller Micron .005 black marker. Here is a detailed close-up of what I'm just speaking about so you even have a better idea of how fine those lines are. I begin painting the knot holes on the planks with sepia and raw umber. The vegetation is a comp combination of sap green and deep sap green. Now it's time to paint the barn planks with a combination of raw umber, burnt umber, and sepia. Here's a close-up photo of the boards and foliage. Uh, they have already been covered with melted wax. The boards will be partially covered with the wax, however, uh, because the cracks in the boards and the spaces between the boards will not be covered with melted wax so that a darker wash can go into these areas to add an illusion of detail. Here you can see that that wash of sepia has been applied and worked into the small unwaxed areas of the boards. Here is a close-up detailed photograph where you can see the waxed areas and where the sepia was worked into the unwaxed areas to give an illusion of detail to the boards. Now all the boards have been covered with another layer of wax so that those cracked details are completely covered. So the only thing left is that background sky area and around the foliage area in the center of the painting. So now I'm going to cover all those unwaxed areas with a wash of sap green and deep sap green in the foliage areas which I will blend up into the sky areas with thalo turquoise and Prussian to create the blue sky. The sunlit areas in the sky are new gamboge and are simply allowed to blend in with those two blues up in that upper sky area to make an illusion of highlight and to add some interest to the sky. Now the entire painting was dry and I am preparing to completely cover the entire painting with a layer of wax. You can see my little skillet where I melt the wax and I do use usually standard batik wax or sometimes I use paraffin or a mixture of both 
be sure that if you're heating your wax that you always use ventilation and remember it is hot use care don't handle with fingers be aware that once a brush is dipped in the wax that's pretty much all it's going to be good for so I'm getting ready to add that final layer over the entire painting that I call the cracking layer here is a detail of the cracking layer and you can see how it obscures many of the details of the painting underneath when the cracking layer has cooled I remove the push pins and I lift the painting releasing it from the support board. Cracks often appear in this process and I will usually actually bend the painting to get additional cracks for the next step which is applying a dark wash over the entire painting. Here you can see I have a dark indigo wash and also a dark green wash. The green goes below third and the blue wash usually I will go ahead and put over the top area here. This is a close-up shot of the uh, cracking layer being covered with the wash and you can see how that watercolor wash right now is being re refused by the wax. It's being resisted. That is why the next step is quite important. Another layer is going to go over this completely to help push those washes into the cracks. Once that layer of wax is brushed over the wash, putting it into the cracks, I have to work rather quickly. I don't want the washes to continue spreading under the wax, so I immediately heat up my dry iron to the cotton linen setting and prepare to remove the wax layers. Here's my ironing setup. Plenty of craft paper and newsprint to absorb the melting wax and all work areas covered with plastic tarps a large trash bag nearby to accept the used papers. I also keep windows open and a fan running for adequate ventilation. It can take some time but be sure that you get all the wax removed. Um, be patient, it will happen. And here you can see that once the wax is removed that the gin washi is being thin will reflect the color of whatever is beneath it. Here you see on your left, over just the cardboard, it's sort of dull, but put over the white mat board, it, uh, colors come alive. You need to probably, after you finish on gin washi, to protect the painting and to make framing possible, mount it on a piece of white mat board cut to the same size of the painting. I use either Yes Paste or an archival spray adhesive to attach the painting to the mat board. The painting is complete. Now here it's mounted on the white mat board. If any corrections are needed to be made, I either use watercolor almost directly from the tube or gouache. I usually frame my watercolor batik paintings much like any of my other watercolor paintings matted in a wood or metal gallery frame and with acrylic glazing. Your creation, however, you can handle any way you desire. Thank you so much for joining me as I shared my adventure into this watercolor batik process in creating a painting that was somewhat off the cuff. If you enjoyed this video, please become a subscriber. And whether you are a beginner or experienced watercolorist, or whether you're interested in watercolor batik or more traditional watercolor, I have instructional watercolor videos that would possibly be fun for you to give a try. So until next time, keep painting.